Hey guys, and welcome back to our channel, The Upper Hand. Today will be our fourth video in a series of videos that we have been doing on goniometry measurements of the hand and upper extremity. We also have a few other goniometry videos on our channel, so if you haven't checked that out already, make sure to find us on Instagram or YouTube and check those videos out. And if you're not already following us on those platforms, make sure to give us a follow. So today, uh, the range of motion video will be all about the thumb. Okay guys, so we're going to start with the MP joint of the thumb or MCP joint of the thumb, however you denote that. So I'm going to turn him on the edge of his hand. That's just the way to get it off the treatment plant or the, the wedge there to get his thumb free so it can move freely. Um, so we'll start with MP joint flexion. Um, obviously you can have them actively range before, you know, just to see um, the general sense of their range of motion. So we're going to lay the goniometer on the dorsal side of the digit and the hand, and we're going to position the stationary aspect of the goniometer, the dorsal surface of the first metacarpal axis of motion is going to lie directly over the MCP joint of the thumb, and then the moving arm of the goniometer is going to lie on the dorsal aspect of the thumb here. And so what I'll have them do is while I'm stabilizing that proximal portion of the goniometer on the first metacarpal, I'm going to ask them to move into MP flexion, I might tell the patient to pull their thumb across their hand. And so I'm just going to kind of not putting over pressure, but just following their motion with that goniometer and then getting a reading. And he's at 65 degrees of motion there for MP joint flexion. Obviously for MP joint extension, it's going to be the exact opposite of that. So I have the patient extend their MP joint as much as possible. And something interesting to note is some people have IP joint hyperextension naturally. In this case, he does. And so you see that there's going to be a skewed measurement because the goniometer is lifted higher than what the actual MP joint extension is. In this case, you would actually slide the goniometer off the edge. Make sure it's still in line with the dorsal aspect of the proximal phalanx, but you want to avoid the skewed measurement caused by that IP hyperextension. So just make sure uh, essentially that the moving arm of the goniometer is in line with that proximal phalanx and that will give you the true extension measurement of the MP joint. So for IP joint motion, it's going to be the same principles that we applied to the MP joint motion. I'm going to allow that stationary arm of the goniometer along with the proximal phalanx of the thumb. The axis of the goniometer is going to lie directly over the IP joint of the thumb and then the moving arms lying directly over the dorsal aspect of the distal phalanx of the thumb and I'm going to block out and kind of stabilize here. You don't want to block out and interfere with that IP joint crease because obviously that will limit the patient's motion so make sure you're cleared proximal of that but stabilize that proximal phalanx of the thumb and ask the patient to move into IP joint flexion then just kind of lightly follow down with that goniometer and I'm measuring at 80 degrees of IP joint flexion there. For IP joint extension, opposite of that, have the patient extend their IP joint. Many people have zero degrees of IP joint extension. Some people have a, a degree of hyperextension. In this case, he does. And so in, in the case of any joint, when you have hyperextension, a stainless steel goniometer like this maxes out at zero. So in this case, you'd want to swap to some sort of goniometer that will allow you to measure hyperextension. Same principles apply, align it with the dorsal aspect of the finger here, and then allow the patient to go ahead and actively extend the IP joint, make sure the goniometer is flush with the portions of the digit that you're measuring, and make sure that axis of motion is still lined right over that IP joint, and we have IP joint hyperextension here measured. Okay, so a third measurement that is really useful for measuring the thumb is a composite thumb flexion measurement. And the best way to do this is to have the patient actively flex their thumb across their hand towards their distal palmar crease, which sits just below the MP joint at the fifth digit there. Most people in an unaffected hand should be able to touch that distal palmar crease. And if they are not, then that gives you some good insight as to where there are some deficits at. So the way I would do this is have them first actively flex. I would maybe tell the patient to actively pull their thumb across. And in this case, for example, we will have him not be able to come across to touch the distal palmar crease. And I'm going to take this goniometer, which has centimeter measurements on the arm of it here and I'm going to place it on the distal palmar crease and I'm going to read as he pulls down into thumb flexion towards the distal palmar crease I'm going to read the measurement and measure the distance between that distal palmar crease and the tip of his thumb and right now I'm reading right at one centimeter. So you can also passively range the thumb in the flexion if they're not actively able to flex all the way across to the distal palmar crease you can passively range that hold the goniometer with one hand while you passively follow them uh, to the distal palmar crease with the other hand 
and measure that distance and you can compare passive flexion versus active flexion and that can give you some insight as to whether or not there is some extrinsic tightness which we won't go into today. Alright so now we're going to cover CMC range of motion and first we're going to cover the motion we probably measure the most which is CMC radial abduction. So for this measurement you want to locate the CMC joint here and then you want to set the axis of the goniometer right over the CMC joint because of course that is your axis of motion. So place that there. For CMC radial abduction, you want the stationary arm to be over the dorsal aspect of the second metacarpal in line with that bone. And then you want to make sure that the moving arm is in line with the dorsal aspect of the first metacarpal. Just make sure that those stay in line with those bones so that you get an accurate measurement. So you could start out with the patient with a relaxed thumb in a loose pack position and then have them actively abduct the thumb away from the radius, which is why it's called radial abduction and then just record that measurement and in this case we have 50 degrees of radial abduction. Another measurement that we less frequently record is thumb CMC palmar abduction and of course that is just where the thumb is abducting away from the palm. As far as goniometer placement it's going to be the exact same as the principles applied in radial abduction. Axis of the goniometer is going to be placed over the CMC joint and then the stationary arm will be placed in line with the second metacarpal and the moving arm will be placed in line with the first metacarpal and the same principles apply as they move into palmar abduction. You just follow the mid shaft of those bones to record that motion. Hey guys, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to watch this video. We hope you learned something today and that this was helpful to you in some way. So you know our goal for this channel, the upper hand, is to give you guys the upper hand as you seek to better understand conditions of the upper extremity and just all topics related to occupational therapy in general. So please take a second out of your day, make sure you like this video, and subscribe to this channel so that you can be sure that you're going to see all of our upcoming videos. Thank you guys so much and we'll see you next time.